Hi, everyone. Welcome to Tech Down Over. This is episode number 53. I'm joined today by yes. Double O Blanchard. Yes, Jeff Blanchard from Australia. Mm -hmm. Melbourne, to be precise. Well, Tommy, how's Money Penny doing? Well, um, I'm uh, getting a bit hot today. I know as uh, you guys over there, uh, the temperatures start to cool down. Mm -hmm. We've got a temperature today of going to be 108, and it's oh. 10 o'clock in the morning here, and it's still it's already 86, uh, and it's oh. not expected to drop down below 89 overnight. So, well, that should be a lot of fun. Well, hey oh, Jeff, yes. we've got a really good guest on today, and yes, we'll I'm excited him. about this. Yeah, same here. So here we go. Pinnacon D750, where does it fit? With the D810 being the top dog uh, underneath the D4S, and of course the D610 being the entry level full frame, the D750 is somewhere in between with dual SD card slots and a max shutter of 1 4,000th of a second and max uh, shutter sync for flash at 1 200th versus the D810 has the 8,000 shutter and the 250 sync. So, how well does the D750 favor? Well, it's 24 megapixel and it's full frame, and it's less than $2,300. The camera is great as it has two things that the D810 or the D610 or any Nikon doesn't really have, and one of the most important things that it does have, New York. And joining us today is that gentleman, that very hey, good thanks. videographer and reviewer, Corey from Famous Media. Hey, Corey, how are you today? Not too bad. How you guys doing? Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, I'm glad right. you could make it on. And and um, like 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 we said in the pre-show, you know, we only invite people we like. And I think you do some of the best reviews in the industry. Mm -hmm. And there's a there's a certain person that comes out of that. I mean, there's a warmth and there's a a sense of humor and just uh, and a, and a gutsiness because living in New York and running around with so much good gear that's pretty good. Um, I grew up in New York. I remember that. <laughs> But you do a great awesome. job. But you, but you don't have somebody doing a, a review on a camera that goes for a 43 minutes and you watch every single minute of it and, you know, and enjoy every single minute of it. So well done, Corey. What I Thank wanted you. to just start off with, what, what got you into the photography business? Uh, you know, it's hard to say because when I was younger, I was just playing with my mother's camera. She, she had this uh, Polaroid. You guys remember the ones that mm -hmm. spit out the prints instantly? Yep. And, uh, I, still got one. <laughs> I remember her buying them and like, hey, don't play with them. They cost, you know, a lot of money, like $15, $20 or something at the time. And she was like, don't touch them and waste them. If you want to take a picture, I'll show you what we could take a picture of and I'll help you do it. Well, I would take it. I would run through all the, the, the film and they'd be gone. And my mother would be a little upset and like, wow, you just burned all my film. And so she ended up having to buy me a camera. And I started <laughs> on one of the old uh, Nikon um, F-series film cameras. And I played with that for a little while. And I kind of just really loved it. I was always, you know modeling or doing something as a kid. I was a model as a child, child model, and I was actually doing some acting. I'd actually met Bill Cosby and a couple other people, which, you know, surprising today's industry, uh, it's not really a good thing to uh, mention, but uh, I did actually meet uh, Bill Cosby when I was a kid. Uh, I've worked with a lot of different, you know, actors and studios when I was younger. Kind of got out of that phase and really liked operating the camera more. So, when I was in high school, I ended up spending a lot of time behind the camera doing plays with the school. I'd be the one filming it. Uh, back then, we didn't have the technology we do today, but we did have 8 millimeter Sonys and stuff like that. So I just got really into it there, and then uh, I just really wanted to study and get better. So I spent a good uh, five or seven years just really, really honing my craft and practicing while I was running other businesses like a recording studio. So um, that's where Famous Media came in. It was actually the MUS on the Famous actually stood for music. So I would actually had a recording studio. That's what I've been doing my whole life and playing guitar, drums, sax, uh, piano, and a bunch of other different, you know, instruments that I kind of mess with a little bit for fun. But I really do play guitar, drums, and sax, and piano, um, 
all the time. And I actually sing, and I actually have a couple of singles on, believe it or not, most people on my YouTube channel don't know this, but I actually have two of my newest uh, singles are still on iTunes right now that I released last summer, like six months ago. So oh, music is what got me in, you know, to being able to afford to buy the gear and start. So I started from somewhere just like everybody else does. And that's why I wanted to do the YouTube channel was to help people uh, get better so they could get where they wanted to be because no one was there to really help me. So I kind of just did it on my own. So I just well, really wanted to get there. Well, I would say you've done a great job because um, mm -hmm. this you're looking at right here. That is the Nikon D750, and I was the, I was about to buy an A10. I saw your review on the A10, and I went, I want it. And then I said, I've never had a, a, a Nikon before. So I said, well, I've had Canons, I've had, um, I have the Panasonic GH4 and the GX8 and all those. And I said, you know, they're great cameras, but I wanted one full frame. And the Canons just weren't doing it for me. And I watched your review, and I was about to get the DA10, and then you and another person I know, Darren Miles, who's a photographer down in Florida, he said, you know, the 750 is a better bet. And so last weekend I went and got it. And for the first couple of days, I sort of hated it. But that was me because I That's never true. worked on a Nikon before and it's different from what I'm used to. But now right. it's been about a week. I, I'm actually liking it quite a bit. It's, it's pretty cool. It shoots yeah, beautifully. They, they balance well. They, they, they feel do. good at the hands. The D750's they, got the best grip of all the Nikons made. You, you know, it's funny. I agree with you. This is an incredible grip. I have pretty big hands, six foot two and rather large. It's like, ah, this feels good. And then I'm listening yeah. to somebody else's review and he goes, it's got the worst grip I've ever had. <laughs> you just can't please everybody. <laughs> but no, this is I, nice. It's really hard to. I mean, what made me, I used to shoot Canon. I actually okay. had a 5D Mark II and a 7D. Um, and what made me switch over was a couple of things. First, that really bothered me is that the Canon 7D was one of the worst cameras on low light. And, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's certain cameras that just can't shoot in low light at all. And there's other cameras that can do it if the lighting is well. And then you got the Sony a7S, which you can take into a black hole and it looks like daylight. But uh, the 7D was just a little noisy and the dynamic range wasn't there. Um, the 5D Mark II is, is a staple in Canon. It's the one who started the Beyond the Film competition, which I participated in back in 2009 and 2010. And that was a blast. Uh, but when I held the D800 and uh, the D4, uh, I even actually bought a D3S at one time. I, I figured, you know, maybe I will switch over. And what really caught my eye was something that most beginners or amateurs don't grasp, which noise performance is great, but there's something a lot more important uh, than, you know, noise performance. And that is dynamic range and, and accurate color rendition and, and color bit depth. Um, and at the time, the D800 was definitely better than the 5D Mark II. I still stand my ground that the D8, 10, D800, D800D, and D4 have better color bit depth, better dynamic range, and are overall a better camera than the 5D Mark III. Uh, they just have more dynamic range and more color. That's not because I don't like Canon, though, because I'm not biased. A good tool is a good tool, right? So um, no one's paying me to do my YouTube. A lot of people have asked me about that. I'm not being sponsored or paid by anyone. So if a camera is good, it's good. Uh, the 5DSR from Canon is a huge step forward. It doesn't have as much dynamic range as the Nikon cameras, but the Canon 5DSR is probably the best camera they have ever released, uh, <laughs> unless you're doing sports, which then again, that'd be the 1DX, which is another fabulous camera. Right. Uh, but, you know, overall dynamic range and color bit depth accuracy, you're going to get more of that with Nikon cameras uh, than you will with the Canons. And that just, you know, if you go to DxO Mark, it shows the same thing that, uh, they're just not the only sensor that beat Nikon sensors, which by the way are Sony, some of them, uh, is the red, uh, the red dragon's the highest rated camera sensor ever made. Um, and I shoot all my reviews or most of them lately on the red dragon. But, uh, when it comes down to color and bit depth, you still got the, the a seven R Mark two, which is the new, going to be the new, hopefully the new, uh, D eight fifty sensor. So. The, the Nikons and Sonys are where the color, bit depth, portrait, and dynamic range come yeah. from. Canon's lagging a bit behind that, but it's not to say their cameras are bad because they're not. It's just they got a few steps to jump forward on. Yeah, in fact, I got the uh, 7D Mark II about two months ago. You know, I, I swore I would never get another Canon again. I was so ticked off at them. And then I, I, I don't know why I did that, but it's fast. Now, that's one thing yeah. it is. It's pretty fast at 10 or 11 frames a second. And... Uh, I, I've practiced martial arts, so we did some, 
filming of just as fast as I could move, like five seconds, and it's amazing. There was not one shot that was out of out of focus. I was going, wow. Yeah, I have not been able to do that with a GHX or a GH4. I haven't tried it with the Nikon yet, but it's not as fast, only six frames a second. But it's pretty amazing how accurate those cameras are. Um, but yeah. of course, Canon falls behind. You don't get articulating screens. You, you, you just have to put external mm -hmm. on everything, and then it just becomes a lot heavier. So Yeah. Canon, Canon's a little Gloria. behind in the dynamic range and a couple of the features. Um, the good thing about the 70 Mark II is for the money, it's unbeatable, though, because the 70 Mark II has got, you know, arguably as good a low light as the 5D Mark III for my tests. Mm -hmm. um, the Mark III performed better between, you know, the lower, um, you know, ISOs, but once you get up to around 3,200 or higher, uh, it seems like the 70 Mark II was pretty close if not beating the 5D Mark III. Like in my video, some people had said, oh, you fell into the um, same trap that other photographer had fallen into by having the auto noise reduction on, but I actually didn't have the noise reduction on. Um, so it's hard to definitively say this camera for sure is better, or that one's better, it's gonna right. determine, that's gonna be determined by circumstance. But to have a camera that's now, what is it, like $900 at B&H? So yeah, it's no, cheap Mark, and it's a great Mark camera. The is still about 1500 1300 something like that? It, I think B and H had a blitz sale or something where maybe, you could get it maybe. for nine ninety nine or it was eleven ninety nine or something. But it was fairly cheap for what you're getting. I mean, yeah, that's how I got it. it. I got it for I think it was twelve hundred. They had five hundred off at the time or six hundred off. Yeah, I was going, that was wow. it. Wow, yeah. as it is, this this shocked me. Um, of course, I made the mistake. I got I got it with the kit lens. They had a thousand dollar rebate, so it's a thirteen hundred dollar kit lens. I don't think it's worth it. Um, I only played with it once so far, and it seems slow, but I've got the Tamron 35 millimeter on it right now. But with the kit lens, it was $3,600 and $1,000 instant rebate, so it went down to $2,600. So in essence, for $2,600, I got this with the kit lens, but I could have gotten 400 off. The camera at 23 would have been 1900 I could have bought a better lens. I I did buy lenses, but I could have bought a third lens. That would have been better than the kit. I don't know what you think well, about the kit camera. lens. The 24 to 120, I think, something like that. Oh, okay. Eh, it was well, so so. Better than so most kit lenses. Quite good buy. Quite good buy here. The, the Nikon the 750, here is going for 2295 for just the body, but that's Australian dollars. So if we convert that into American dollars, it's probably about seventeen ninety nine, because yeah. uh, the American dollar's worth so much against the Aussie at the moment. So it's uh, quite a good price. Now, Corey, just a question for you. I see you do a, a lot of uh, wedding photography and that, and different types of weddings. How do you decide, or how do you decide out of all your equipment what to take and uh, video and still cameras? How do you decide on the equipment you use? Uh, it's really tough. Sometimes I'll be like, I just want to bring everything. And that's sometimes is not an option, especially if the room is small or if I've looked on their website, there's not enough room or it's a wedding that's in a really small venue where I can almost bring nothing. I've got to really decide what I need. Um, it also depends if we're shooting outdoors. Uh, I absolutely cannot stand the sun when I'm trying to shoot. Uh, mm -hmm. So I typically shoot with all my subjects' backs uh, to the sun, and then I light my subjects so that I'm lighting them the way I want, and then I'm getting the exposure in the background exactly how I want it. Uh, so if I'm shooting in the sun, I've got my standard, you know, 4x4 four four or 8x8 eight eight or sometimes even 10x14, um, you know, expandable shades that I'll put over top of my clients and I'll have my assistant or my other photographer if I'm shooting video. I'll help out with the photos, which is really unique being a videographer and a photographer is that I can actually not only do the video, but when my photographer is with me, we can assist each other to get the photos done as well. So uh, it's really fun. If I'm going to be doing outdoor, I'll bring that. I'll also bring a couple of speed lights, which I use the Young Nuos because of the price, $50 for a flash, and I've got like 10 of them, been running them like dogs for the past three years and they still all run perfectly. You're not going to get anywhere near that for manual flash with Canon or Nikon. So I did a video on that and they're, they're pretty much the best bargain flash you can possibly buy. The Young Nuo, the YN2s is what I have, but the YN3s have the built-in wireless trigger. They're good as well, 20 bucks more. Uh, so I'll, I'll grab that if I'm doing outdoor and if I'm not doing uh, any outdoor at all, uh, then I will just get, you know, organized on my camera bag and picking lenses and cameras 
typically I, I carry light because uh, I, I know exactly how I shoot at a wedding, so I'll grab my D800 uh, and I'll grab my D4 all the time, and then I'll have my 24 to 70 is like, you know, religious to me. That is the lens that is always with me. I could never go a wedding beginning to end without using it. In fact, I use it over half the time at a wedding. Um, my 70 to 200 is my ultimate portraiture lens, especially for doing my signature traditional shots um, of the couple, like the bride and groom, because uh, at 85, at 1.4, you're going to get a, a tad more, you know, depth of field than you would at the 70 to 200 at f2.8 while you're all the way out at 200. But the difference is you shoot at 85, 1.4, and if her eyes are in focus, her nose and her ears are not, whereas the 70 to 200 at 2.8, you're getting the same uh, depth of field behind her, but her face will be more in focus. So I really always use those two lenses. Uh, the 85, 1.4 is a specialty lens that I use for accent shots and portraits, individual portraits or party portraits at the actual reception. So I pretty much carry light. Um, I carry the necessity lenses and camera bodies. I need extra spare batteries and memory cards. And then of course my stands and my lights. I like to light the whole dance floor when I'm shooting a reception um, for the first little bit. And then I turn all the lights out and I go around and get individual portraits. So my clients will have shots uh, that light the couple perfectly, but have all the colors of the accent of the room behind them. Oh, and then I've got the other shots that light the whole room so it shows everything going on. I've given my customers a variety. So uh, the day dictates, but I usually typically carry the same set of gear. I just decide how much extra stuff I'm going to bring for an outdoor adventure and whatnot, which sometimes can be very fun and a headache too if it's 97 degrees out and you've got yeah. batteries overheating. So that, that can be a problem too. Have you ever recorded with camcorders on the weddings? Uh, you mean like doing videography, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. The last camera I used would be the Sony, the H5U. Okay. Um, I also like the HPX170 from Panasonic. Uh, those were some good cameras. Um, I also like the HPX2000, uh, or the HVX2000 is from uh, Sony, the other one that came out before the, uh, the N5U came out. Some of the Sony NX cams are really good um, for tape, and I used those back in the day, but with the digital, uh, some people call me crazy, but I shoot all my weddings now uh, exclusively on red uh, mm -hmm. and on black magic. I use film cameras, and uh, maybe a little bit later on, if there's time, we can get into some discussions on how you are supposed to properly shoot a wedding uh, with a film camera, because see, with uh, DSLR, you can just crank the ISO, the room is bright, but that's not a good thing. So with film, that's what I shoot on. People think it's a hassle, but it's not. You just light your subjects in your room, and I shoot everything in film. I shoot in 4K and 6K. My clients are blown away, and I go through a lot of extra work, though, to set up the lighting, but once you get used to doing it and know what you're supposed to do, uh, it's really not that bad. It's just an extra 20, 30 minutes of setup, but the end result can't beat the end result. DSLRs for video are great. And they're easy and they're light and they're decent and low light. But if the end goal is the absolute best dynamic range and best cinematic look, I'm not going to get it with the DSLR. Yeah. So that's the, that's what helps me decide wherever I'm doing for the day, whatever the clients want. You know, if it's raining, that just throws a wrench in the whole plan right there. We got to start packing umbrellas and I got to hire someone to come up and hold umbrellas and stuff. So <laughs> it depends on weather too. Weather is a big factor in deciding what I'm bringing, but all my camera bags are waterproof. So now on the Sony, especially the A7S Mark II and all that, I I've heard a lot about heating, how, how overheating, I should say. Especially in New York and with in summer, how, how does that, have you had any issues with it? Um, I've been um, questioned about my review, about why I didn't have any overheating issues. Um, mm. I ran the A7R Mark II at a wedding for an hour. Uh, I had to stop and press record again internally because it stops like at 29 minutes and some change, but right. never had any heating issues. And in fact, uh, when I was doing the reception, I ran the A7R Mark II into my Shogun recorder and let it run until the SSD drive filled up, which was about an hour and 15 minutes and the camera never shut off. The room was 75 degrees and outside it was 97. So. Uh, maybe it was because where my camera was set up in the room, there was a little bit of airflow, which I just got lucky. Maybe. I, I'm not uh, a camera engineer. I'm not a circuit board designer, so I'm not 100% sure what's going on inside the camera. But I do know that I haven't had any issues with it, and I have the A7S Mark II, and I never had any issues with that. My review was shot outside in the cold, so you can't okay. really count that. 
but I did shoot with the A7S Mark II at a wedding. Same thing, internal, shot for over an hour and never had a single issue with it. So you think that's something being put out by maybe Nikon and Canon to say you didn't want to put a shoot with these things? <laughs> I, would like to think, I would like to think not. Um, that would be a very dirty tactic. It would uh, be. Because it's not fair. So yeah. um, I wouldn't think they would do that, though. I mean, there's no way to really know. But what I do know is that not every camera is equal. I've had people say that the D600 uh, had dust and oil issues. I had a D600. Yeah. Never had dust or oil issues of mine. Yeah, I heard people were talking about flare issues. I believe it was on the 750. I, it, it's been perfect. I haven't seen any issues with flares or anything like that. Looks beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I never had no issues with it either. Um, I was actually shooting with it and had no problem. It, it's just one of those things where maybe my luck is just great and I didn't have that problem. But just because I didn't have the problem doesn't mean you won't. There's no real way to know. But if the only thing I was making a point in my video is, is if you think that every single one of the cameras have problems and it's a guaranteed <laughs> recall that you're going to have problems, why didn't I have problems? So yeah, exactly. it's more subjective at this point. I also think a lot of people, and I've seen this, they treat cameras like trash. Yes. I've seen people throw things around, they don't clean them, and you go, I mean, man, you got to treat these good. And when you open up, you clean out your lenses, you clean up before every shoot, everything's mm -hmm. clean and gentle. I know Jeff, Jeff is like I, we're, we're very fastidious about gear. Mm -hmm. It's like got to be nice and clean and, and, and loved, loved. I think that's the key word. <laughs> Love TLC. That's what yeah. I do. I feel like I'm like overreacting with that because I'll be sitting downstairs in my. Uh, I have you know uh, an office and an actual camera loading room where all my gear is, and so I'll be sitting there. And my wife will ask me, "Oh, you know, what are you doing? You're cleaning your camera again." And I'll have the red and I'll have the low pass filter out, and I'm kind of using swabs and cleaning out all the filters and all the lenses and dusting everything off about once a month at least, maybe more. And, uh, you know, you've probably seen my videos if you've watched a couple other ones that if I'm doing an unboxing, I never open the lens cap or the caps on lenses or on the, especially on the camera, never a, a body cap. I'll never open that because it's pointless. You, you open that and dust just falls right in mm -hmm. and it's just, it's just not good at all. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I've seen guys do that in reviews. Like, oh, I'm unboxing the, the D800 here or the, the D4, the, the Canon 1DX. Let's go ahead and just open the body cap and let's look at that mirror because we don't know what a mirror looks like. So we're going to stare at it and let dust get in my $7,000 camera. We're going to turn it up. We're going to look at it. And I'm just like thinking like, wow, okay, it's a lot of money wasted. No, no, Maybe it's just because I'm picky, but you know. I, I discovered something just yesterday. I, I've had this problem. never had it before. But with my GH4 with the GX8 and now with the Nikon and the 7D Mark II, occasionally I'll, I'll take a shot of myself. I'm usually at night, I have nobody to practice with, so I'll practice against myself to see, okay, how's the exposure looking, good, bad, and different. And occasionally I get a green circle, almost full greenish gray circle in the middle of my eye. I'm going, what the heck is that? Nothing is reflecting as a perfect circle. Well, I had cataract surgery about 30 years ago and I'm seeing the implants perfectly through the iris with the flash on it only happens when I have the flash on and it just dawned on me last night I go that's really freaky I can see my contact lenses <laughs> inside the eye wow wow that is, that's pretty interesting I've got to show it to my I've never seen that before I've got to show it to my optometrist and go hey you ever see this let me see if I can show it I didn't That's prep that for the show. I've never, I've never heard anything like that before. Me neither. It's, uh, uh, let me see if this is so one what, of them. Yep, there well, it is. Uh, um, it's, oh, he's got the picture. I don't know if you can see this. Can you see that okay? Yeah, it's a little blurry, but uh, that, that's the contact inside my oh, eye. It's just, just gone oh, off now. I'm sorry. Oh, darn. I have to figure out how to stop that from going it, away. Your image review on to like one minute or four minutes. Yeah, I've got to do that. Minute. I was. It's one of the things I haven't gotten to yet. Hmm. Um, but it's it's literally the implant because I know one of them is off center. Because sure enough, it's off center. Uh, it's pretty amazing. But so the flashes are so powerful and they're close to you that they can actually see inside the eye, like the stuff they use in optometry offices to see inside your eye. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. 
It's yeah. definitely cool that it was able to do that. I mean, the built-in flashes are very powerful. I remember using it was at Disney World last year, and uh, I was actually going through. Um, it's a small world because my wife wanted mm -hmm. to look at it. Actually, it was two years ago, and I shot off a picture, and the flash was so bright. Uh, it, everything was blown out. I was like, oh my God. So I, you know, I'm adjusting it and I, I don't like internal flash when you're doing mm -hmm. weddings because it's not professional. You don't, you can't control it as much, but uh, they've come a long way. Uh, I was able to put a little diffuser on the on-camera flash and I was able to achieve pretty decent results, even in pitch black uh, with the DSLR. So and I was shooting at f2.8. So the, the on-camera flash is pretty good. And when you're in a pinch, if you know how to use it, and you have the right diffusers or even paper. I can even take white paper and just hold it there while I'm taking pictures. And if you, if you can do it just right, uh, you can make something work with it. It's not going to be as good as having, you know, uh, like a full-out flash from Young New or Nikon or Canon or something. But uh, they've come a long way with on-camera flash. Yep, uh, I remember true. back in the 90s, they had this little square flash unit to be yep. in the front of the camera and it was crap. Yeah, that's funny. Now, so, when you do, go ahead, go ahead, Jeff. Oh, no, I was just going to say uh, before, I've been looking, looked at your review for the A7S Mark II, and I, I must admit, I'm just getting so confused with all, uh, all the Sony uh, different numbers of the A7s, but uh, you've quite, uh, explained it quite nicely. But I saw the A7S Mark II and the A7R Mark II, uh, and I'm just... Well, I think you just froze. <clears throat> oh. He he froze, Jeff. And uh, I was just going to say, I was wanting to buy the A7S Mark II after your review, how the excellent video quality was on it. But I saw it only have a 12 megapixel camera. But the dearer one, which doesn't do as well, has the 42 megapixel mm. sensor. What's, what's the main difference between the two? Uh, well, for video, uh, 4K is actually 4096 by 2160, whereas mm -hmm. Ultra HD is, you know, 3840. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's a little different. Uh, so when you actually multiply 4096 by 2160 or 3840 by 2160, you come up with right around 8 megapixels. Um, you know, 8 to 12 megapixels is right in the range of doing 4K. Uh, so what Sony's done is the uh, A7S Mark II is doing internal 4K at full frame. It's using the entire sensor, so you're not getting any line skipping or pixel bending. You're gonna get the full 4K. Uh, with the A7R Mark II, full frame is pretty noisy and soft in comparison to Super 35. The reason is because it's a 40 mega, uh, 42 megapixel sensor, and 4K is nowhere near that. In fact, 42 megapixels, we're talking like seven and a half K probably, or almost, you're, you're getting real close to eight K resolution, which is IMAX. So what they've had to do is super 35 crop, which uh, allows you to not worry about pixel bending line skipping issues, uh, which is why it's sharper and better in low light and overall much higher quality than the full frame version um, on the A7R Mark II. So what it really comes down to is if you really need a good photographer's camera, but also video on top, the A7R Mark II is definitely better. But if you're not into high resolution prints and you just want something like the equivalent quality to say a D3S or something like that, 12 megapixels more than fine, it's the same resolution as a D700 from Nikon as well. So if you don't need high resolution prints, you're gonna get the 4K at full frame. So it's also gonna be deciding factors are you shooting wide or are you going to be shooting portrait? If you want full frame, you want to be able to go wide and you also have long lenses and video is your goal, A7S all the way. If video is your secondary, but you really also need good photos and you don't mind the Super 35 crop because you have a lot of, you know, APS-C mm -hmm. or DX body lenses, you can get away with shooting the A7R Mark II because, like, let's face it, if you got a Tokina 11 to 16, Super 35 is not going to be a problem at all. Mm -hmm. So... It goes off of what lenses you have and what your end goal is. If you need photo and video, A7R if you need big prints. But if you need photo and video and you don't need the big prints, you can still get away with the A7S uh, Mark II. Or you could just pull a me, which I have gas syndrome, which is gear acquisition syndrome. And you could just buy both just so you have them both. I mean, that's become a problem. It's like contagious. So maybe I'll cover my mouth so I don't get you guys infected with well, it. Well, the, the sad thing is when you said We're that, I went, infected. we already have that. Both of us. <laughs> We're all infected with gas yeah. syndrome. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you're going to be infected with gas syndrome pretty That's soon. Right. <laughs> and what, what, what we've done in the past is done something silly like get the cheaper option. 
but that always leads to getting the dearer one anyway so we always start yeah. from the dearer one and then work our way down i think that's the, the thing but you always find a use for for something that different camera but i think that's explained it quite nicely to me the a7s and the a7r anyway so now i understand exactly so i think i might i want to have the a7s uh, but i probably all would also would like the other one as well but like you said, I can't resist and might have to get the two. But the $4,200 price tag <coughs> here just slows me down a little bit anyway. Yeah, I think the A7S Mark II is a little cheaper. I think it's a couple hundred bucks less. I could be wrong, but I think it is. Yeah. I want to say yeah. it's in the 3100 range. I may be wrong. Yeah, I think it was. it's right at the 3000 whereas the A7R yeah. is like in the high threes. Yeah, it's like 38, something like that, 37, 38. Yeah, the A7R Mark II is great. I took a shot of the moon at 200 millimeters and cropped in like 200%. You can see all the craters on the moon. Really? Uh, That's pretty good. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's really good. Uh, the thing is, though, is I compared it to my newest video. Um, the five, I don't know if you guys have seen the 5DSR video that I just took Jim, one of my photographers. He's a 25-year veteran in landscape and real estate and architectural <laughs> work. So we took him out, and we did some work on the 5DSR. And believe it or not, the 5DSR is the sharpest DSLR ever made. Um, because oh, okay. oh. the D800E, believe it or not, the D800E is not quite as sharp as the D810, but it has slightly better low light, technically. I, I don't know why that is, but the D800 and uh, D810 are great cameras. They're very sharp. The A7R Mark II is a tad bit sharper than the D, uh, D800E, but it's not quite as sharp as the D810. Hmm. They're about neck and neck. But the 5 DSR in my video clearly shows that the Canon is out resolving both of them with that 50 megapixel sensor. So if you're a diehard photo and you don't do any video, or if you do video and it's just you know your individual videos for YouTube or Facebook, the video quality is 1080p by 24 or 30 frames in the 5 DSR, which is great for what it is for 1080p. But the photos, the only lack on the 5 DSR is dynamic range. Um, the low light's fantastic. Uh, you, where would you ever imagine you could shoot at 50 megapixel and be able to get an image at 6400 ISO and it's still better than the original 7D was at 800 ISO. So That's you, pretty you amazing. Know, uh, it's a great camera and the only lack that it has or feature that it's lacking is dynamic range extended. So it only gets about 12 stops versus 14, 14 and a half of the Nikons and the Sonys. But that's really the only downside to this camera because of the fact that it's out resolving everything. So if you, you know, like you were saying, you want the, the A7R because the 42 megapixels overall, uh, it, again, it depends what you're going for because for video A7R, uh, for lightweight A7R, if you've already got Sony lenses, it's the A7R. Uh, it wins in every category, but if you're strictly, you know, looking to do straight up photo, you're not going to be doing photos on the A7R Mark II with native Sony glass. You're probably going to have an adapter and use a Canon lens. And mm -hmm. if that's the case, mm -hmm. I recommend getting the A7S Mark II and the 5DSR as your photo camera because you're going to get more megapixels and you're going to get sharper images and it's cheaper. So you can use the A7S as your video and the 5DSR as your photo because most Sony shooters are on Canon glass anyway. So that just solves your problem mm -hmm. completely. Interesting. Well, you, you, you answered my next question because my next question was with the, the 5DSR and the A7S Mark II and the, the, the D750, what to get in that, but now you've convinced me, now I need the, uh, I just haven't had time yet to see the 5DSR review, but I'm going to have a look at that, but uh, uh, I think that sounds like the way to go, have that and the uh, Sony A7S uh, Mac too, so that looks like the the uh, great one to go for. Well, also you said something that's that's unique in today's day and age: Canon and Sharp, because they've yeah. been getting blasted for being soft focus on almost everything. And I've seen a little bit of that. I don't see it on the 7D Mark II; it's pretty sharp. But on the full frames, I'm hearing that now. I almost got the 60, and and I've read a lot of reviews, and and they all said. Nikon just eats it alive like the 750 just eats it alive in, in a lot of different categories and and I and I didn't go for it I, I like the fact that the Nikon was more flexible the the 60 reminded me of a full frame 7D Mark II kind of almost the same camera uh, they look the same <laughs> so yeah it's 
it, we're getting real, you know, the, the lines here of differences are getting close together. Yep. Like, uh, there's so many different ways you can set up your gear and what you're looking for. Like, I was just helping him with the A7R Mark II, and if he was strictly only looking to buy one camera, it would have to be the A7R Mark II if he needed high-res photos. But because he wants good video and good photo, you know, the fact that the 5DSR focus is a little faster than the A7R, he's able to juggle what he buys because... Uh, we're, we're all shooting Canon lenses with these adapters now. Like, there's so mm. much uh, information out there and so much equipment and technology uh, that I can go downstairs and pull out my A7S Mark II and pull out, you know, a 5DSR, and I can I can put the same lens on both cameras with the adapters. So mm. I'm no longer limited just to just shooting Nikon lenses because I've got Nikon and Canon lenses. So mm. I find myself, believe it or not, putting a Nikon 14 to 24 with uh, an aperture adapter that I can move just like a film uh, film mm. lens will adjust, and I can put that on my Red or my Black Magic camera cameras or my Sony, but then I'm also putting Canon lenses on them as well, and then I'm able to share all those lenses with the 5DSR, so I can take any Nikon lens with an adapter or any Canon lens and put it on the 5DSR. That's why I would recommended that to him, is that uh, if he's got mm. Canon lenses, which I'm sure he does, almost everybody does, uh, you can just basically mm. get a Nikon adapter and you can use all Nikon, all Sony, and That's all Canon lenses on your Sony. So you have three sets of lenses that you can use on one camera, and if you've got the 5DSR, you can share two of those three brand lenses over with the Canon. So it, you're, it just opens up your possibilities that you can pretty much with the Sony and the adapter and the Canon 5DSR, like I've got mine set up, you can just go around and just pretty much buy any lens you want and it's going to fit. That's great. Yeah, lately I've been switching to Sigma. Uh, I got a couple of the Sigma art lenses. The uh, this is I got it for the 7D Mark II, and that's the uh, 18 to 35. That's a beautiful oh lens. God. That is a. I saw you using it on one of the was it the DA10 maybe, or maybe it was the 750. You switched to it at one point. Yeah, uh, it might make you feel better, but every review you've seen on my channel in the last year and a half was filmed on the Red or Black Magic using that lens. Oh, really? And, yeah, all of them. Even the low light, everybody asks, so how do you get your Red and your Black Magics to shoot in New York streets so so dark, looks so good? Well, the uh, Sigma 18-35 is the sharpest lens um, in its class. In fact, even at you know, f 2.0, it's as sharp as most Canon or Nikon lenses are at mm -hmm. 2.0 easily. Uh, the lens is sharper at 1.8 than most other lenses are at 1.8. The sweet spot of the lens for low light and best sharpness is 2.0. 2.0 and 2.2, you're spot on sharp and great low light. You can get 1.8, it's a little soft, but for the fact of it being a 1.8, it's still sharper than most lenses are at 1.8. Uh, but the art lenses are fantastic. I also have the 24 to 35 I'm going to be doing a review on. It is a brute monster. You have three primes, 24, 28, and 35, full mm -hmm. zoom at f2. Uh, great for video, especially if anybody shooting on red knows that the 18 to 35, you have to zoom in the 22 when you're at 6K because it's too wide of a lens, APS-C lens, whereas the 24 to 35 will be the perfect lens for that. All their primes are good. Um, I don't want to get into a gear war or have people right. commenting on this video yeah. and being, you know, insulted if they purchase they a Zeiss Otis lens, but uh, the Zeiss Otis only resolves a fine more detail than the Sigma 50 millimeter mm. does, and um, I compared them. DxO Marcus compared them. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I don't want to be quoted exactly, but I think the Otis is around 39 px in sharpness, and Sigma's in the 34, 35 range. Interesting. And most Nikon's are in the 32 to 30, 29. So that shows you the Sigma lenses are very sharp. So you've got the Otis is definitely sharper than the Sigma. Um, but what is the difference in price? You're looking at $4,4500 versus $600. And in my opinion, if you're shooting something that absolutely requires it, like commercial billboard work, architectural work of any sort, um, corporate headshots that are very high end where the client is required that kind of a shot and need max sharpness at 1.4 because you're in a dark room and you can't use strobes, that's great. That's the, that's the lens for you, but remember, it's manual focus, whereas the Sigma is almost as sharp, almost, mm -hmm. and it's got autofocus, and it's only $600, so in reality, the differences are there, but are they really worth the price tag that's seven times the amount? Right. That is up to the person buying the lens, and in most situations, nine out of ten, it will not. That's interesting. Yes, and who, who I think one of our guests said, I don't know who said it, but it said, uh, 
you don't buy gear to work you work to buy gear <laughs> who said that <laughs> that is so true that is so true it's man it's like i spent the first uh year doing weddings which is oh god back in 2004 2005 and i was really really getting heavy into it that's when i was just wanting to get as much work as i could so it's been a little over 10 years now and i remember every time i'd make money at a wedding i'd be backup shooting and solo shooting you know small weddings and i'm like wow all the money i'm making is going to gear and i had a 5d mark ii that i bought in 2007 and i or 2008 actually when i bought it because it came out in 07 and uh i loved it and then I just kept buying gear and I was like, wow, all my money's going to gear. And then I got busier and busier and busier to the point I'm at now where it's not as bad now as it was then. Uh, I'm doing, you know, better. Everybody does better when they work, if they work hard. If you want something bad enough, mm. you can have it. Nothing's stopping you. You're your own limitation. Uh, so, but I, I do find that the better I'm doing and the more money I make, the more I spend. And then, you know, back then I was only looking at Canons and Nikons, but now I'm looking at Ari Alexas and I'm looking at Reds and I have a Red Dragon. So it's like, you make more, you're doing better, but then you look at more expensive gear. So it's a vicious circle that professionals can relate to me on that. It's gas, it's gear acquisition syndrome. Sometimes yep. I'll be at a store and I'll look over and I'll see, you know, uh, like at BNH, I saw a used price on a GH4. It was like $899. I already have a GH4, uh, but, but have a second GH4, you know, uh, for only $800. That, that's a problem. That's a problem. <laughs> I love gear, but uh, some people have that problem with me and they can relate to it. And uh, it's like a mechanic. You can't fix a car with just two screwdrivers and a wrench. You have to have a little bit of everything. Um, me being in film, I, I've had directors call me and be like, hey, I need, uh, want you to shoot this. We want 4K, but we are not looking for the red look. So uh, we don't want red. We actually are looking for a Sony look. So what do you have in Sony? And I'll tell them, well, I have an A7R Mark II and an A7S. I got an A7S Mark II. I have access to an FS7 or FS700 if you need those. If we need... Um, Anything else like the F55 or the uh, the F5, we can grab those. Um, some directors will say we're looking for the Black Magic look, bring those. Whereas other directors will call me and be like, look, we're shooting uh, we're shooting strictly on red, so bring the dragon and we'll hook you up with our other uh, epic dragon that we have and we'll be shooting directly on those. So, um, and I've also had guys that say, hey, if you have GH4s, we have two, we need two more. We're going to shoot on you know four GH4s. That's what we're going to shoot on. So it really honestly comes down to the film. But being a true videographer and passionate artist like myself. Um, sometimes it's not really gas syndrome, you know, just a joke or uh, it's kind of funny, but mm. what it really comes down to is sometimes I have to have at least one or two of every brand. So if I can have the equipment yeah. to look they're going for, cause they all look different and they're all great tools. Uh, I tell my I, wife that all the time. Yeah. It's especially being in LA, I, there's guys yeah. in LA that got two of everything because <laughs> yeah. when it was Steven Spielberg calls, you know, um, like Shane Hurlbut or something says, Hey, I, I need two C three hundreds. Uh, on this one and two Aries on the other one, you know, nine times out of 10, he's going to have to go with that. There's no arguing with the director. So, and if, and if you're the director of photography and you're also the cinematographer or, and, or the director of the film, you have to go with what the producer's looking for or what looks best. If I'm shooting a movie in the streets of New York where it's kind of dark, you know, and, and the permits that I have don't allow me to have big overhead city lights and I can't block traffic, I'm going to have minimal lighting. I'm probably going to shoot on a Sony F55. Um, <laughs> or I'm going to shoot on something else, like maybe a couple of Sony FS7s. It really depends on the, the uh, clients. It depends on the story. It depends on the scenes, the lighting, the permits, how much outboard gear we're going to have. Are we going to be carrying heavy stuff? Do I have a lot of crew? If I have a heavy crew, we're going to run cranes. We're going to run reds and aries, whatever we're doing. So it depends on your crew size and a bunch of stuff. But like you know, it really gets down to a lot of technicalities. Now, if you had the money, if you had, let's say, 6000 bucks. And you could buy uh, a C100 from Canon Mark II, C100 Mark II, or something else. What would you buy? Hmm, that's a that's a tough question. Um, yeah, Jeff and I go I through this all the time. We both want C100s, but we're not sure. Um, I filmed on the C300 Mark One, mm -hmm. and. It was a fantastic camera in every way. It has the Canon log. Uh, the, the one problem, though, with the camera, uh, the low light was great. Uh, I never had any functionality issues. The camera never overheats. or it, There was no reliability issues at all. The camera's great. Uh, the, the only thing is it's plagued with Canon's disease of having lack of dynamic range. You only get about 12 stops. Now, if you're shooting in a studio, c three hundred's great. Um, but I really do like the C500 because it's 4K. However, the new C300 Mark II is the same price as the 500, 
but it does 4K internally. So mm -hmm. it's a great camera, but if you're not needing 4K, the C100 uh, Mark II actually does just about everything the C300 Mark I did. Now, your question asking me if you have uh, $6,000, what to buy, it depends on what your end goals are. Now, if you need a camera that is strictly 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 for studio like say your podcast um your best bet would probably be an ursa mini 4.6k from black magic or an ursa which you can get a discount uh if you want the 4k version um or the black magic studio camera and uh, those cameras are really good for studio work they're also good for weddings but if you need something run and gun that you can just grab and run out the door and film with not worry about lighting yeah. as much and you're a little bit more wide open for low light the c100 is the better choice um because they both have canon mounts so at the end of the day that question is really what are you looking to do if you're looking for sdi 6 gig mm. sdi 12 gig sdi if you're looking for time code and you're looking for all the good stuff you get in the film industry for your guys's podcast show or something similar black magic would be the definite way to go for that uh unless you don't want to screw around with lighting in your studio then um then you might get away to C100 because it's a great camera too. I've never used it though, but based on specs and what you're looking to do, that'll kind of decide a little bit as well. But for yep. studio work, I might recommend Blackmagic for that. Yeah, that's a good recommendation. We're using right now in studio the XA25s with the SDI oh, okay. connectors. Okay, and awesome. They run fine. For what we do, it's it's pretty good. Yeah, if you, you'll you notice your quality will jump. Even it's good right now, but it'll go to too high a quality. Like well, when you you have the Black Magic Ursa Mini, if you guys were to try that out, rent it, and give it a shot, you probably have to yeah. you know turn it down from 4K. You have to turn the settings into 1080. But it's a, it's a nice studio you guys got there. And, but this uh, is what it looks like from the backside. So wave back this way. Uh, <laughs> oh, they have three people. I got so, it. It's like a real production today, isn't it? Yeah, we've got Dante <laughs> in here who's coordinating the shows. We got Clark who's running the vmix software right now and i'm doing the switching with uh, you probably can't see it but my little mm. switcher a little uh, novation switcher oh that's awesome you guys got a a really good setup i think that um and this is all our look, i don't know if you can see small. this part yeah, they can. yeah you can see this so these are all our compressors limiters gates got the apex the persona studio channels it's fun uh, yeah, I do see that over here. Look, yeah. the, the bottom racks, uh, almost from this far, I can't see what they are, but they look so similar to the Focusrite stuff that I had. Uh, yeah, these are these. These are like the Focusrites. They're the uh, Personas' uh, okay. studio channel, yeah. the Apex studio channel. Uh, here we've got the audio, audio box from Personas, which has really good... Uh, it's an 18 input. It's nice. It's very clean. We got rid of our Mackie Onyx 1220i and put this in its place, our audio has been a lot better. And then up oh, here, I we've got our Skype machines, which are Mac minis. Nice. You guys are uh, pretty rigged out and we're having a blast on your talking about gear. I, uh, I think that um, mm. if you guys are down for it, maybe we can definitely be work talking more and working more on stuff on the show. Maybe get like a, a one on one video photo talk, like a monthly episodic or even maybe even a weekly episodic would be cool. I mean, That's I was fun. thinking about starting that for my YouTube channel and doing my own show, mm -hmm. but maybe we could work together on something and just do it with you guys. Cause that I would think be a blast. So and um, yeah, I think that would be a lot of fun. We, we yeah, like doing things definitely. like that and and uh, you know what you're doing which makes it even more fun so yeah we have so much stuff to and talk about we've been been chatting for an hour that people are going to be watching the show and having a blast and we have so many things we could still touch base on in this show and so many things we could talk about we could have something going on every week where uh, my viewers could also come over and meet with you guys on the show your viewers can check me out we could work together on some stuff because that could be a lot I was of fun. thinking about starting a show but I, if we work together I wouldn't do that I'm, I'm going to be in New York on the 14th, 14th and 15th. Well, actually, I'm, I'm going to be in Stanford, Connecticut, but we're meeting somebody in New York. Maybe if you have some time, if you're not busy, I'll, I'll send you my point, my schedule. But I think awesome. we have some time, if nothing else, to catch a coffee, maybe in the afternoon, Grand Central or something. Um, yeah, January, right? You said? I'm sorry? You said it was January? In January 14th, 15th, we'll be in New York and Connecticut. Maybe I'll set up a photo walk for all my followers in New York on the same day after our meeting. So if you have a few minutes to stick around, you could like meet a lot of the people that are subscribing and okay. we can all do a little walk around. If you have time, if not, then I won't, I won't set it up for that day. But I was thinking about doing one in January anyway. I just thought it would be kind of cool maybe. That's fun. 
That's fun. Well, I love what you do in New York. I grew up in New York a long time ago, um, but I'm not. You're from Canada. I was born in Argentina. Jeff's in Australia, but he's really British. So none of us seem to be able to find our real homes. But anyway. Um, um, yeah. And, yeah, I grew up in Queens. Where, where do you live? Do you live in New York proper? Uh, I live just outside of New York. Um, okay. I'm like maybe 10 miles from the uh, from the Manhattan Bridge now from Staten Island. I'm like a mile outside. Oh, so okay. not far at all. I didn't want to live in the city uh, because of the fact the traffic. And I, I really, something I've never told any of my viewers, they get to know me a little better today, uh, but I, I've never mentioned it, but I'm a very avid, uh, you know, person when it comes to cars and performance. <laughs> and if I can't park my car in my driveway, I'm not very happy. <laughs> so I love cameras. I love what I do, but I also like cars and I also like my personal space. I don't think I could do well in an apartment uh, where I'm being told to be quiet or not be able to move or not be able to park my car without having to fight people on the streets. It can be a hassle in New York, and I'm there almost almost every single day sometimes. But yeah. I don't know if I want to live in the city. It's a great city, and I, I love going there. But living there 24 hours a day would be a little too much for a guy like me who just enjoys his you know, personal space. I have a son, too. Um, he's just born in November. I've never told my viewers that yet, but I do have a son. So he was born. He's got to have his space too, and uh, I'm teaching you're, about you're cameras. Are, so, just November. You know. You're a very recent dad. Yeah, yeah. Um, hey, congratulations. Been, thank you, thank you. He's five weeks. He's growing up really fast. I almost want to freeze time, but <laughs> in only a year from now or two years from now, I'm going to be teaching him a little bit about cameras. And he's going to be grabbing yep. them, and I'm going to be showing him how to use them. Have a nice well, uh, person to work with. My own son will be working with me eventually. Well, Maybe we right take over. He's got. Be, he's got a. 14 month old now 13, 13 month old oh awesome so rats too they they grow up fast he's eating oh. out of house and home oh yeah five ounces of milk uh every three <laughs> hours and most babies his size do three to four so he's like just he won't stop eating which is good and he's growing really fast so <laughs> It's, uh, I find myself shooting a YouTube video and, and in between the editing. So I'm, that's what my viewers want to know why that sometimes my videos are coming out slower in the last six months. It's because my yeah. wife was pregnant. She gave birth. I'm trying to do a lot of stuff. I'm trying to get more content out though. Um, I'm also going to be launching a forum board in the next two to three weeks. It, hopefully by mid January, the absolute latest. Uh, I'm going to be launching a forum board where you're going to be able to come in and learn about every camera. I have a section for cool. every camera. Uh, you're going to be able to buy and sell gear, check out my reviews, going to be a, a, set, a section to chat with me. And if we work on something in the future, we can even have a little section where the podcast may even go live on the site or something. Uh, sure. We can extend it to them, sure. too. You know, we something. do have the ability to stream live through YouTube right now. We were on Ustream, but there weren't enough viewers. Everybody's at work when we, when we come on. So, right. so we decided to stop the streaming after five years. But YouTube, we can stream live events. We're, we're approved. So we just haven't done it yet. That's I used coming. to use Spreecast back in the day, and Which it was one? okay. Not as good as YouTube, though. Which one? Spreecast. A Spreecast, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's pretty good. Um, I used to do it when I was doing my photo competitions. I stopped running photo competitions because I was really busy with the job, you know, my career, and uh, YouTube. But I'm going to be starting up some photo competitions. Um, that's something else we could probably talk about, too, is that when I run the photo competitions, I can announce the winners. If we ever decided to work on something together on a weekly or monthly show, yeah. we can maybe even announce the winners on your show. Something. We can come up with something really sure. fun. That sounds like a lot of fun. I'm open to everything. I, I, yep. I, I'll try anything once. That's the kind of. That's why I'm very, uh, you know, open on my channel, and I try to be funny. But at the same time, people do come to my channel to learn. They come to learn, have a good mm -hmm. time, and laugh. There's certain channels out there that I'm not going to mention that were really good, and I think they did a great job. And you probably know who I'm talking about, where it's become a complete joke now. Everything is about making them laugh, and the camera takes up one minute of a 15 oh. minute skit, and everything's I think a I joke. I know who you're talking that. about. Yeah, I think. Yeah, and. And the thing is, is that it's great to be funny. It's great to make people laugh. And uh, kudos to them for all the great work they've done. But the thing is, is that people also come to learn. It's all about a balance and personality. They mm -hmm. want someone who's mm -hmm. confident, sure of what they're talking about. Uh, no one's perfect, though. I've made a couple of mistakes here and there uh, where I haven't thought about something. I'm like, wait a minute, I was wrong there and I've had to correct it. But they come to learn and have a good time and also get some laughs. And so I'll make jokes at my videographer. I'm sure you've seen it, the D750 video. I made a joke at him. 
but a shoelace being undone and I point at him or I'll take a photo of him and I goof around I make jokes about potholes and killer clowns coming yep. out of potholes and yep. stuff like that <laughs> just because I want my viewers to laugh but I'm not going to spend 15 minutes of a 20 minute video making pointless jokes about New York City or fun stuff yep. and then be like oh by the way this was a review on this camera and it does this and this have a great day like it doesn't make sense so I try to give them the best overall balance of everything and I enjoy your comments about Ray or Johan or whoever your camera guy is that day. And, and some yeah. of them are funny because you, you, know, you know that they're not always quite doing what you want them to do. And they're like, kind of going this way. No, wait, he just went this way. <laughs> and uh, that makes it sort of fun. It's a hard oh, job yeah. what they do. It's actually tricky. It's a lot of fun. I've had well, Ray. Ray, I, Ray used to do my videos. He doesn't. He's not uh, doing videos right now. He's got a son, too. He's kind of busy. So mm -hmm. uh, John took over. And... Um, they're, they both have a unique way. If you've looked at the videos, you notice that every videographer I've used to do my videos has a different artistic approach yep. to the video. Okay. Um, typically, mm -hmm. I really uh, think that Johan's done some great work because I get comments about how he'll have me on the edge of the frame, but he's showing the scenery in the back. He's got a very landscape and artistic mm -hmm. eye, um, which a lot of my newer videos have been great. And also, my brother is a videographer too, and he shot my D800E, my oh, Nikon 2470, okay. my Nikon 50 millimeter, and Miami review he shot those so I've got um, a handful of people that do videos with me but Johan and, and my brother Cody are the ones that are doing the majority of my videos today um, even my wife will actually shoot some of me she shot some of my iPhone videos any videos you see that are not in the city me and my wife are shooting those but, cool. <laughs> yeah it's 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 awesome I love what I do I love I love you know helping people the best I can I got a whole bunch of content coming this year and um, we're going to have so much stuff to talk about because I want to go into so many different things mm. with you guys. And I think that we're going to have a lot of fun. If you'll have me back, that is. I mean, oh, absolutely. Want me back, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, That'll be fun. <laughs> That'll be a lot of fun, actually. Yeah, well, we are. We're already way past the end of our time, but that's okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah definitely. You know, we'll definitely have you back on. I'll send you my schedule for January. And awesome. uh, let's, let's plan ahead sometime. Have a, I, have a, I just have need a, to get going shortly, Rick, because I've got an appointment at 12, so I need to get off soon. So. Okay. And we'll have a have a Merry Christmas, have a Happy Holidays, yes. and a very happy, healthy, prosperous New Year to, to both of you. Awesome. Yeah, you guys yes. too. It's been, it's been great fun today. We'll definitely have to get up in January and, and talk when we have coffee about possibilities of the future, maybe having something, you know, that's episodic. That'd be great. That continues yep. on. If we can come up with something like that, people would mm -hmm. chime in to watch. Every oh, I agree. Around. And it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Mm. Yeah. And I've got so much stuff to talk about. All you have to do is let me know what you guys are thinking about talking about for an hour and we can just mm -hmm. you know, chit chat and elaborate on all the details. You know, it'd be great. It'd be a lot of fun. That sounds, that sounds good. Well, we appreciate you coming on. We'll see you next time and I'll see you in January. And Jeff, awesome. as always, have a good one. Yes. If you're watching the show, Shall please do. subscribe. Give us a thumbs up or whatever you want to do. And uh, by the way, I've only gotten negatives. I got a whole mess of thumbs down when I made a comment about Apple once. I made some sense about <laughs> Apple gets idiotic sometimes. Man, did they go nuts. It's like, geez, <laughs> sorry, yeah. guys. I mean, Apple's great, but they're not perfect. I love they're Apple. Not. But yeah. You, but you have people that take it to heart. They're like, oh, he said something wrong about Apple, and I love Apple. Mm. I mean, I know. you know. Where they get nasty? It's like, geez, yeah, sometimes up. it gets nasty. I yeah. get nasty comments once in a while on my YouTube page saying yeah. uh, things I can't say on the air right now, but right. they'll say that, right. and, I, and I'm looking at why, and it's all because I said that Nikon had more dynamic range in Canon. And oh, in yeah. reality, I don't want that. I would like <laughs> yeah. my 5DSR to have 2,500 stops of dynamic range, but that's not going to happen. So I'm just pointing out the facts. I mean, you got to take it with a grain of salt. Not everybody's yeah. going to like you. No matter, no. no matter what I do, I'm going to have people that like me even if I sucked. I'm going to have people that hate me even if I'm great. Right. So it just it comes and it goes. It doesn't bother me. I'm there to help all the people that are honest, people that enjoy it, the people that like me, that want to watch me, that want to like you and watch you, will watch you. Um, and then there's going to be people that don't like either of us for no apparent reason. Yep. The way it so works. it's just the way it is. Well, hey, have a good one. What, Jeff? Okay. We'll see you guys next week. Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye for now.